The topics discussed in this show may be triggering or harmful for some listeners. We tackle topics of suicide, self-harm, violence, child abuse, and death. Our hope is that even if you aren't able to listen to the whole story, that you can join us for the first 15 to 30 minutes where we catch up and gossip about our lives and the world. We will be intentional on marking where triggering information may be, as well as having timestamps in our episode descriptions for those topics. Thank you. Welcome to the Best Friend's Guide to Money and Murder. I'm Claire. That's Caroline. And we're back. We somehow made it another week. Oh, Lord have mercy. We really did make it, didn't we? Yeah. I'm proud of both of us, collectively. Me too. You drove all over the state of Kansas Mm -hmm. to go check on your little chickens. Mm -hmm. I drove to the ends of Kingdom Come. Didn't stop working Friday until like 6.30. (laughs) oh no my mom texted me and said that your little giggles with good for you honey makes her laugh oh no i'm sensitive (laughs) mom you can't say that shit to me i'll start i'll cry i'll fucking (laughs) hi amy amy love you so much i am too sensitive to handle that so thank you i'm glad i can make somebody laugh yeah. my like mom her. likes it oh. when we talk talk about her so cute <laughs> i love that honestly relatable this week i have a caffeinated sparkling water oh i have um sprite because uh my body hates me and my tummy hurts i'm 25 say the word tummy because stomach sounds too serious so i'm just gonna be sipping on that Good old juice. Cheers. Okay, caffeinated what? Club soda. Oh, oh my god, yum. I don't know. Them. I almost, like two weeks ago when I first saw it, almost got it because it was, this is blood orange and grapefruit flavor. And I was like, yummy. And then I saw in the thing, it was like 35 milligrams of caffeine. And I said, and I did not need that. <laughs> yes, you did. You did need it. I went to the store yesterday and I got that and normal club soda. I don't like club soda, but I'm really happy for you. This month, where'd she go? We're back to March, my friend. Where Every time I think about that, my my brain stops working. Like, it was Friday the 13th that we all basically went on lockdown. Yeah. Which is the spookiest thing in the world, first of all. I remember where we were. Like, I remember where I was. Yeah, I remember I was home from work, and I got an email from our boss the, like, Monday afterwards. Like, we all left early, did a little bit of working from home, and at, like, 4 o'clock, they're like, you were working from home for the next two weeks, effective immediately. Mm-hmm. And then the next morning, I was like, I texted my boss and I was like, hey, can I go to your office and get a monitor? Because working on my laptop is not going to work for me. It ain't going to be it. Like a little gremlin, I went into the office like first thing at like in the morning <laughs> and I like, had to carry out my huge like 27 inch Apple monitor by myself. Nice. It was so, and it's one of the old ones. So it was really heavy. It was as heavy as you are, honey, probably. Yep. And so... Good for you. Look at you being a strong woman. You don't need anybody's help. Okay. But somewhere, somewhere... But you needed it. You wanted it. (laughs) I want to see the security footage of me trying to lock the doors. Someone got to see that. Oh, why couldn't it have been me? (laughs) Pre-COVID, we would... Um, like my team and I, my coworkers and I, we would like go every couple of months and have a team outing just so that we wouldn't want to all quit and like, you know, to have time to just be buddies with each other. We were at a restaurant eating food when like my boss was like getting, and so were we getting emails and stuff from our like higher ups saying like, Hey, like 
you can't like none of your clients can travel anywhere outside of the state like now we're actually going to go on full down lockdown so like you can go get your stuff and this might have been the day before the 13th or the day of it was like you can go get your stuff on monday but like you have to leave the office it was so crazy because we were just like we all unmasked unmasked we were all like at a what was it kiosk it's like a Hibachi? The food in, yeah, the, the food in front of you. Uh-huh. Uh, and we were all like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. We had a couple people going on spring break, and we had to tell them, like, hey, like, it, if you don't need to go out of the state, maybe don't. Or don't take our, like, don't take our, like, don't take people with you. It was crazy. Taylor was still in school at the time. And it was right as his spring break was coming up. He got the email being like, we're extending spring break a week. And so he was That's like, okay, right. fine. Fine, I'll like just hang out with you. Uh-huh. And then the week they were supposed to come back, or like they were back, he got an email saying it was a Tuesday. And they said, if you can go home, you have to go home. You are being kicked out of your housing. Because he was on campus. I remember was, that happening for Maddie and me just going to go get her. Yeah, I was on a call. And me like, baby girl, you're coming with me. I was on a work call when Taylor was texting me being like, I'm getting kicked out. I I have to go move home. Wow. And so I was like, so I was literally like, hey, I gotta go. My boyfriend drives a Toyota Corolla. He can't really move himself home. Question mark. Yeah, and like I think I get I gotta go do that. I'll be back. And they're like, Are you guys okay? And we were like, Don't know. Sure. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, but if you don't wear a fucking mask, then I don't feel fucking sorry for you. And that's all I gotta say. Oh, so this leads into my story, so I'm gonna tell you. So I was yeah. again traveling everywhere on God's Green Earth in Kansas today. Or not today, this week, right? Yeah. And I was, where that is, I was in like the, I'd gone to Wichita, had gone around Erie, Kansas. I don't know if you know where that is. Good old two hours away from uh, where we're currently at. Went to a gas station before I needed to be somewhere else. And I was the, one of the only ones wearing a mask in the gas station, Claire. <laughs> One of the workers was not wearing a mask. I was washing my hands in the bathroom and a mom comes in, no fucking mask on. It's so weird. Her daughter that. comes in, no yeah. fucking mask on. Go out of the bathroom. I'm like, where am I? What's happening to me? I saw maybe one or two workers with a mask on and nobody else that was a customer wearing a mask. Good thing I'm vac- vaccinated. If I was smart I- <laughs> and feeling vengeful, I would have, like, pretended to get on my phone and say, oh, I have COVID? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, everyone around me not wearing a mask should probably quarantine? Oh, gosh. But, so that was yeah. really fucking funny. I'm uh, glad you didn't provoke them, because, like, not trying to get the call being, like, Caroline got killed in a gas station in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Yeah, there are a bunch, yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. You know, I decided... I'm tired. I'm going to choose the battles that I face and the Lord will take care of the rest and I will just do my job. <laughs> this ain't my job. I'm going to get out of here. As I made eye contact with one of the workers that had a mask on and I was like, and then I left. This leads me into my story. I am covering a good old Kansas story. I am covering the spooky story of the bloody benders. They are one of the first notable serial killer families, and they're from around the Parsons, Kansas area. Whoa. Neato, huh? This is kind of a spooky thing. So this family is from a long time ago, Claire, like eons ago, aka the 1870s, (laughs) a couple hundred years ago. It's fine. Eons ago. Too long. The family consists of John and Elvira Bender and their kiddos, John Jr., I'm sure he got bullied, and Kate Bender. Am I going to be a jerk about the story? You betcha. It's okay. It's our podcast. 
It's our, I can do what I want. Okay, so <laughs> I'm tired, guys. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to say so a lot, and that's just what's going to have to happen. And I'm not going to apologize for it. Okay, so some say that the younger two, Kate and John, and throughout all this, like, there's no technical proof anywhere. And maybe that could be, that's a pretty specialized statement, but that these people were related at all. So they just had two different, they collected two children? So, well, so, so there's, there's some people say that John Jr. and Kate were actually married. Like, I'm going to get into it. Yeah, so, I need to just buckle in and listen up. To, remember, like, last week where I was like, it doesn't, it's downhill. It's just, it's just it kind of goes downhill from here. Honestly, okay. all of my stories do, but. Just like this week, she's going downhill. So, um, John, the old one, John Sr. and John Jr. Uh, John is in his 60s, and the junior one is 25. Uh, oh, okay. Mom in this story, Elvira, is in her like late, like middle 50s. And then Kate is 23. You were saying kids, and I... I should like an eight and a ten year old going around like axe wielding. Honestly, I <laughs> that would have been way better. That would have been more fun. And that's why but I was confused not. about the whole like not related thing. They are a German immigrant family, okay. which is important to note because it's been recorded that John Senior didn't wasn't very fluent in English. Um, notably, Elvira didn't understand. English either and she was so mean she was known as the she devil okay cool I want to that's what I want to be um uh John Jr I'm gonna call him JJ because he's irritating me already um he could speak English with a pretty decent German accent and Kate seemed to be the most fluent uh English speaker out of all of them yeah, so Elvira was known as the She Devil. John Senior was known as just a POS. JJ was known as an idiot. <laughs> no, I'm like I'm kidding. You're like, what do you have against JJ? I no, I'm not kidding. The, I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up right now because I'm. This is like. The, these are straight I only give you straight facts Claire so he was handsome with auburn mm-hmm. hair and a mustache he was prone to laughing aimlessly which may which led many to consider him a half wit okay I'm not fucking kidding I, when I tell you people were not nice about these people I'm not lying. so oh lord have mercy Okay, so halfwit JJ, poor guy, and then <laughs> we're not gonna be able to make it through. We are, and then Kate was the spiritual one. Oh Lord have mercy, she was the most likable. Okay. She was self-proclaimed healer and a psychic. She okay. would give lectures on spiritualism and would prefer would conduct seances that's kind of everything she seems really cool like you're 23 years old and you're killing it you know what i mean yeah so we always say we need new friends gotta make new friends so uh (laughs) so sorry you want kate to be your friend you know what i'm gonna pose that question to you and then you let me know at the end if you want her to be your friend okay 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 Okay. (laughs) so um John, the Johns, built a, a cabin, okay, near the Great Osage Trail. Then Elvira and Kate hopped on over once it was done. On the farm homestead, they're called homestead, clear. I had to get that in my brain. There was a cabin, a barn, and a corral, and a well. All of these are going to be very important to remember. Because I'm guessing this is a murdery homestead? It's the best kind of homestead. <laughs> I don't know why the giggles today. 
It's not. It's not the best. <laughs> Would you edit this? <laughs> like, what are these two bitches on today? Ryan, I'm glad the you're. Of life. I'm glad you are on the same level of like, for lack of a better term, crack energy that I am on because. Yes, ma'am. We're the same person. Okay, we're gonna get through it. I'm only on like half of page one. All right. Okay. So the barn was on, um, the route of the Great Osage Trail. This this was the 1870s, so people were still establishing land, um, taking away from Native Americans as people tend to do during this time, and then wonder why Native Americans want to kill them. It's just as a, a what I mean, how could how dare they? How oh dare? How do they not let me take their own land? Anyway, so yeah, so it's kind of a weird fucking family. Uh Kate again gives lectures, conducts seances really an advocate for free love i decided i didn't want to look up what she meant by free love but anyway um yeah more about the family a little bit is that elvira was suspected of killing several of her previous husbands which goes into like we don't really know like how they were actually a family like it could really be that john and elvira were married but are the other John and, and Kate like their kiddos? They think that maybe Kate was Elvira's fifth daughter. It's been said that Elvira maybe have maybe has like twelve or more kiddos from previous marriages. It just where where are they in all this? We're not sure, but good for them for not. Yeah. They're okay, so kind of spooky. Now their barn, their cabin was split off into separate rooms like the front room was considered their general store a place where travelers could stop and eat food stay it became known as the bender inn around may of 1871 the body of a man named jones was found near skull creek with his face crushed in and his throat cut that's aggressive pretty aggressive. February of 1872, two more men were found with the same MO. Face pushed in, throat slashed. During this time, so many people went missing that travelers avoided, ended up avoiding the area. It became so well known that if you go on this part of this trail, you're gonna go missing. That's crazy. Yeah, and seeing about like that time, Word of mouth was really how things got around. That's pretty powerful. That was all. That was all. You had a horse, you had your mouth, and you spread it. Along that same year, in 1872, George Newton Longcore and his infant daughter Marianne go missing. Ooh. This is what starts the catalyst for the rest of the story. Okay. Um, he has a friend. Now, they had traveled from Independence kansas to i think live a better life honestly or they were just passing through i don't know if i fully knew the reason why but they go missing back in independence they have a friend george has a friend named dr william henry york who goes to search for them what a good friend what a solid friend ma'am um isn't successful and is never seen again Oh, now good old Willie boy has two brothers, Colonel Ed York and Alexander York. Now, Alexander was pretty cool because he was on the Kansas Senate and he helped when legislators were being really shifty. And when you're being shifty in the 1800s, I feel like you would be very shifty now. Yeah, they go because he's a colonel. And the other guys in the Senate, they take a man power of 50 men. Whoa. Go and look for now William and the other missing dad and daughter. Good man. On March 
1873, Colonel York and Alexander go to the Benders Inn. The two worlds have collided. The Bender family, they're like, yeah, your brother was here. He stayed the night, but I wonder if he got caught up with, quote unquote, them Indians. Oh. Okay. Native Americans, everybody. Because obviously the Native Americans were angry because everyone kept taking their land. So yes, let's blame the Native Americans once again. Oh, boy. So, on to the next page of this. We're getting through it, everybody. One bullet at a time. So they're like, okay, so he's not here anymore. Got it. Got it, got it, got it, got it. April 3rd, they returned to the Benders in after it was seen that a woman ran out of there saying that Elvira had threatened to stab her. Elvira, you can't just do that. Elvira, we talked about this. You can't go slashing people, honey. Do we need to call your mom? Do we need to call your mommy? I don't think you want us to. I hear German women are very intimidating. Yep. Sounds pretty scary. So, you know, good old Colonel brings this up and Elvira becomes enraged. Oh. And it's found that she knows more English than originally let on. Does she? Yeah, because she, you know, was saying how that's not even true at all and blah, 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 blah. Interesting. Uh, I thought oh, you didn't know English, honey. During around that time, too. So again, this is where everything starts. The pieces start unraveling. Things start coming together, also falling apart for these people. A town meeting is held since so many people have gone missing to decide as a community what to do about everyone mm-hmm. disappearing. Now, both of the Johns and even Ed and Alexander York are part of this meet. Like, they're all there. They're all what? hanging. And it's determined that all of the homesteads between these two places called Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek would be searched. For the purposes of our story, that means that the Bender's land would be searched. What people don't notice is that after this meeting, the Benders disappear. Oh. Three days after this town meeting. They go missing. They go miss. Where did they go? Where Three days. Did they- where did they go? Somebody in the community is riding their horsey past the inn. And they notice that the inn has been abandoned. And they're like, oh no, what happened to them? Now this sweet, precious baby angel probably thought, oh no, the benders are probably dead because they couldn't be the murderers or the people in trouble. I wonder if they're in trouble. Hundreds of people come to do a search party at their homestead to see where they're at and see what they can find out. Boy, do they find out. So they go to the cabin, as one does. They notice all the belongings are gone. Possessions, food, clothing, all them things be gone, which is fine. It leads people to believe that, hmm, where did they go? They also notice an inconveniently um, bad odor coming from the cabin, specifically from a trap door underneath a bed that's locked. So they open said trap door. And what they find is like a little like shoot. They just find a little space that's done, like a little hole. Okay. A hole. A hole. That's with with and I quote one of the worst phrases I'm going to say, but clotted with blood. There's no bodies. There's just a bunch of blood. There, mm. <laughs> Uh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. So, <laughs> no bodies, but there's just kind of a lot of blood hanging around. And they're like, oh God, what the fuck is that? That's not normal, honey. No, not, not, not what you're supposed to find in a weird hole underneath a bed with a lock. You know what I mean? Definitely not what you're supposed to find at an inn. So, part of this farm had a vegetable garden. Uh, our good old cow. Dr. William York is found in said vegetable garden, face down, his feet barely underneath the dirt. <sighs> Poor guy. He really didn't stand a chance than veggies, man. Just to like go back a little bit to Kate, I just heard something back here and uh, just 
she maintained carnal relations with her brother and boldly proclaimed her right to do so. Well, shall we look up what carnal means? I think we should. Because <laughs> that's gross. Yeah. Physical, especially sexual, needs and desires and activities. Good. Okay. So Hopefully maintained- we wouldn't leave oh. there, but we did. We did. You know, we thought it was that and we're smart. And so she definitely, you know, they had a sexual relationship. I'm going to go with they weren't brother and sister. Just- but she was defending it as such, which is a weird rationale. Really? Oh, we're not trying to king shape. We're trying to king shape here. <laughs> oh, they also say Mrs. Bender was a dirty old Dutch prone. Her <laughs> face was a fit picture of the midnight hag that wove spell, murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth. Here's what I will say to go. This story is fucked, but the way people spoke way back when was so beautiful. Even when they were shit talking. Like, I wish I could like talk about. If you're going to shit talk us, shit talk us like that. Okay. Yeah, tell me, tell me I am <laughs> the fit. My face is a fit picture of the midnight hag that wove the spell murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth okay please tell me that I look like that that is how I want to be perceived <laughs> honestly I kind of relate to that you know the night hat. <laughs> so Mr. Doctor the doctor found in a vegetable garden honestly what a way to go that night they find nine other potential grave sites but I think they got so tired that they're like we're gonna dig these bitches up tomorrow yeah. because they, they they're like i'm gonna mark this as a place and then we're gonna go to bed and they did understandable know when you're gonna be productive and when you're not right eight bodies were found the next morning in seven of the the potential nine grave sites that they probably found oh boy one person was found in a well i honestly would probably have preferred to be that person and also body parts were found All of them had their face bashed in with a hammer. All of them with their throats cut. One woman was found, like her body was found, but like not in the way of everybody else. It seems like she was either strangled or buried alive. No. My worst fear. Oh, poor honey. Buried alive. Now this is considered to be one of like America's first mass murder burial grounds since oh. all of these bodies were found wow. 10 like it seems like okay so like in total like 10 bodies are found in their apple orchard vegetable garden area which included yeah. dr york and then also that doctor that other guy mm-hmm. and his daughter just 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 kind of the worst people think that money had a lot to do with this sure just because you know hard times and you had to get rich however you could and that's what they thought so they're said to have only gained about like four forty six hundred dollars from all of this and some horses because a lot of the travelers were not carrying much things that were of value and also because of that too may, many think that maybe they were just stealing for the funsies of it Ooh. now they their wagon was found 12 miles away 12 miles north o- away from the inn okay with their horses, their horses are fine. You know, they were maybe starving, but they're fine. All horses live in this story, or else. It was like, where are you going, bud? No, no, no. no all no. There, ha- it has been confirmed that t- that tickets were bought in Thayer, Kansas. So that's that's what's twelve miles north, I guess. It was for the Lawrence Leavenworth Galveston train, like railroad. Whoa. Which is so crazy because we we know where all those are. Yeah. In Chanute, which I also know where that is, John Jr. and Kate caught a different train and maybe somehow they they might have been, end up somewhere between Texas and New Mexico. For the other two, like there it seems like they might have gone somewhere. There was a guy fitting John Jr.'s description who murdered somebody else, a couple other people with the same kind of way that these other victims were murdered you know i don't know what happened to the she devil um but there's like all these bunch of stuff about this family 
apparently. Like nobody knows where they ended up. They didn't get charged with anything because they were never really found. Maybe John Jr. was actually John Gebhardt. Mm. So maybe not a bender at all, even though most were led to believe that John and Kate were actually brother and sister. But you know, this family was really like, it just sounds like they like got, had fun murdering people who were most vulnerable and taking their stuff. Yeah, because I mean, they could have, they benefited from getting the money, but it wasn't that much. And quite frankly, they wouldn't have bashed their skulls in if they just wanted the money. Like, but that's the funsy part of it for them, mm-hmm. it seems. Mm-hmm. So it said, like, when the visitors were stopping for a meal, they'd be sitting at the table with their back to, like, so they would separate the rooms by, like, a canvas that they would use on a wagon or whatever. So their backs would be, like, to that canvas. Kate would charm the men. While that was happening, the men would strike the unsuspecting traveler in the skull with a hammer. They loved them hammers. Then the women would rifle the money, like their bodies for money, and then they'd push that body through the trap door below the cabin, and then Kate would slit their throat. So that little trap door underneath the bed, it was to hold the bodies before the next day. So yeah, it's the pretty messed up story of the bloody benders. That's crazy. Yes. They're also said to that she could be a hot, like that area is obviously still there because it's a farmland yeah and crazy haunted next time in uh when i'm around that area i might just drive by it i'm not gonna step out of my car i'm gonna try and see if i can do a good old driving by that's an interesting tale so how many people is it suspected that they killed 11 or more wow that was really heavy and i have a not so heavy story to tell you and I'm so oh, excited. thank the Lord Jesus above. Okay, tell me. Today I'm telling you the tale of the time that John Stamos worked with the FBI to catch his blackmailer. I love it. I love... Jo- <sighs> okay, go ahead. Just go. Just John Jameis confuses me. I didn't even say his name right just then, but he confuses the shit out of me. Yeah. Is he 50? Is he is he 16? We never know. We never know. So a little about John Stamos. He was born August 19th, 1963. He's a Leo, like me. He's very cute. Yes. He was born in California to Bill and Loretta. Bill is second generation Greek American. So he got his start acting. Literally his first role ever was on General Hospital in a very prominent role. How old was he? Um, If I remember correctly, he would have been in his 20s. But he was in the full house in the 80s. And that was three years after he was off of General Hospital. Okay, so like 20s. Yeah, probably early 20s. His role in General Hospital led to him being nominated for a daytime Emmy. Outstanding supporting actor. So, like, good for you. Good for you, sis. Yeah. Uh, three years after his time on General Hospital, he landed his role on Full House as Jesse Kanthopoulos. Mm-hmm. And that's like what really like launched his career and made him super successful. And he had a lot of other successful TV roles and appearances, and he did a lot of Broadway acting. But Full House is what he's known for. So he was launched very quickly into stardom and grew a pretty wide fan base. From 2005 to 2009, John Samus had a role on ER, the soap opera. And our story takes place kind of right after his time finished on ER. In October of 2009, Allison Koss sent an email to John Samos saying that she had received an email from a Brian saying that they had compromising photos of the two of them. I love compromising photos. Me too. Uh, I saw in one article that the photos show John with a stripper and there was some cocaine involved. <gasps> a lot of people did drugs. A lot of people did drugs back then. Yeah. Like, according to the FBI report, it was compromising photos of Allison 
and drawn. So I don't quite know what they were. Were they doing like some sexy shit and the people were like creeping? I guess so. So Allison and John met in 2004 on a trip to Disney World, which looked cute. And during that trip, they both attended the same parties. They developed a friendship and would occasionally email each other. Apparently, Allison was 17 at the time, so we do not love that. Do not. Stamos maintains that it was just a friendship. Okay. Like I said, John th- said nothing's ever happened between them. So the email, her getting an email saying that they had photos of the two of them was odd. I see. That would make it gross. Yeah. Her age, that would make it, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Yeah. I'm on the same page as you now. Got it. Allison said she had seen the photos and that they were authentic and said that she even paid Brian nearly $10,000 to get one of the photos. But she did not send the photos to John to show their authenticity. Mm. So then in November of that year, John began receiving emails directly from Brian and Brian now gave himself a last initial. So Brian became Brian L. Brian L. was claiming that he had photos of John and Allison at a party in 2004. And he was saying that if John did not pay, then he would sell the pictures to the tabloids. And Brian said the tabloids were out, were in a bidding war over these pictures and that he was offered $780,000 for these pictures. Later in November, Brian set his demands to John and said that he wanted $680,000 for the pictures from John, and he also wanted the bills to be unmarked. Which, why would you not just sell them directly if you're getting $100,000 more? Oh, well. Mm -hmm. So to avoid police detection, he set a clandestine meeting spot for John to drop the money at. But good old John was not having any part of this fucking nonsense. He went straight to the FBI. Nice. And so the FBI sent in an undercover agent to begin communicating with Brian via email to arrange the draw. I would love to be an undercover agent. Me too. Like, it's so cool. I'm like, I I want to like write the FBI and be like, I want to know who this is. I have questions and I have a podcast and I want to talk. So on December 2nd, 2009, Brian proposed a spot that was outside K.I. Sawyer International Airport which is an airport in Michigan. A surveillance team from the Upper Pen- Peninsula Substance Enforcement t- Team uh, was tasked with observing the location. The Upper Peninsula Substance Enforcement Team goes by Upset, which I think is so funny. When I was looking at their, their, their website, they were like, we upset drugs. Ah, uh, okay. Good for you, honey. Good for you. And it's a multi-county narcotics task force is what they are. At that scene, Allison and a man named Scott Cipolla were spotted and taken into custody. Allison and Scott knew each other from working together at a nightclub, and apparently they were in a relationship together. So Scott was the one posing as Brian L. and even got on the phone with undercover FBI agents. Not a good luck, buddy. Not a good luck, honey. When they searched Allison and Scott's computers, they found that they had written all of the emails from Brian L. All of them. And Allison is who? So Allison was the one that was friends with John and was 17 and at the party. Yes. Okay. I just didn't know if she was like an actress or anything like that. No. The best I could get was that she worked at a nightclub. Okay. Oh, so she's part of The Roots. The Roots. The FBI contacted the Star Magazine and the National Enquirer to see if they were ever offered, if any offers were made to buy the compromising photos. And they were like, we never had any offers made. They never saw the photos. And then they even testified in the court hearing saying that they would have never made an offer to buy photos without seeing those photos first. Nice. Yeah. And they also said $780,000 was far above the norm for paying for photos. Throughout all the communications with the FBI and John, they refused to send any proof of the photos and prove that they had them. 
The FBI conducted thorough searches of both Scott and Allison's computers, cars, hard drives, and houses, and found no evidence of the photos existing. At one point, Allison and Scott said that the photos were in a safe, but when they opened the safe, it did have photos of Allison, Allison and John, but it wasn't like anything raunchy. Like it was just photos of them existing in the same space at the being party. Being friends? Yeah. So him not being creepy like we assumed. Yes. I'd love to see it. So what I find interesting about this, if they had the photos, if these photos did exist and they had them, it would not be a crime to offer to sell them to John before they took it to the tabloids. So if the photos were real, they wouldn't have been committing a crime. Okay. Which is interesting. How would they not be committing a crime? It, it's not illegal to just offer to sell those, the rights to those oh, photos. Oh, duh. Just like anyone would if you like had them take pictures of you. Exactly. Got it. Also during this time, uh, John was receiving emails from a Jessica P. who was claiming she was pregnant and it was John's child. What the fuck? And she also had compromising photos of John. John, honey. Surprise, these emails were written by Scott and Allison. Oh, and he was like, I know nobody. I don't know, Jessica. I'm just trying. My dick has been in nobody named Jessica. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, no. So that was Scott and Allison, and Allison even admitted to it during the trial, saying those claims were completely false. Oh, wow. Wow. Are we surprised? No. The trial took place in the small town of Marquette, Michigan, okay. with a population of about 20,000 people, and it just drew a ton of people and fans to the town. A 44-year-old fan of John named Lisa Pullman was quoted saying why she was waiting to see if she would see John at the trial, just like out in the street watching. Quote, he seems like a really decent guy. I feel really bad that he got dragged into this. That's the consensus. I think all of his fans were like, yeah. What year did the trial begin? Um, 2010. 2010. If you look it up, you can see pictures of them like smiling outside the courthouse. Little buddy. Yeah. So Scott and Allison were each sentenced to 48 months, or that's four years in prison. And that was the result of a jury verdict. They did not plead guilty. They said, we didn't fucking do it. Hmm. But a jury had other words. What were the charges? Like, what technically were they going to court for? Extortion. The judge sentenced Scott to an additional 24 months of supervised release after his time in prison was completed and ordered Mm -hmm. him to pay $15,000 in fines. Mm -hmm. Allison was sentenced to an additional 12 months of supervised release after her time in prison was done. Okay. So kind of the only thing I could see that John's statement on this was after they were sentenced was, is, quote, these slanderous allegations to spear my reputation were part of their defense to redirect attention away from the federal crime of extortion. There was no hot tub, no drugs, no nudity, and nothing sexual in nature involved with my friendship with this woman. They lied about everything, in quote. John was praised by U.S. Attorney Donald Davis, saying, quote, too often victims are afraid to report such crimes for fear of becoming involved in a drawn-out prosecution and being re-victimized by the process. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Arena, the special agent in charge of the FBI, said, quote, the FBI is committed to protecting all citizens, no matter who they are, from unscrupulous individuals who would attempt to financially exploit them. Mm. This sentence should act as a deterrent to individuals who who would use extortion tactics to make a buck. And that's the story of the time John Stamos worked with the FBI to really catch some blackmailers. Wow. It's kind of a short story, but... I loved it. Well, to that, whoever said, thank John. Like, obviously, also, John's got a bunch of fucking money and has the ability and the means and the safety to be able to do that. Yeah, which is a luxury. He is a white cis man with a bunch of fucking money. You won't see women specifically 
trans women of color coming forward for that shit needing help very often yeah. but i agree i think that's helpful that he did that because it showed hey like this isn't okay yeah i'm i'm a big guy and i've been targeted and it is he was a victim of all of this mm-hmm. and and when the justice system does its job correctly this is what can happen yeah and that's awesome yeah i think that's awesome yeah like the fact that i couldn't really find any any other quote about it just them him being like this is scandalous slanderous allegations and they're just trying to spare my reputation it was it you know yeah he's like that's all that's all i got just don't be fucking mean yeah what a cool guy put work with fbi off your bucket list there johnny boy yeah make a movie about it though starring you playing you (gasps) directed and written by you wow hey i'm saying i'd watch it me too netflix documentary style please yeah i want to cover more cases like this because i did find a list of a lot of times Mm. where like celebrities were blackmailed i would love nothing more than to hear more stories i would love to hear stories about yeah i think celebrities and crimes committed against them and how they were able to just like fight the bad guy in real life yeah i think that'd be really cool i'll keep looking into them yay what else you got friend Hmm. i want to just be like kind to each other (laughs) yeah just thinking a lot about you know life and things like that just be not just it does it's not that hard to be nice to others and you'll find that life is easier if you're kind to other people otherwise that's all i that's all i got just be kind to people you don't know what people are going through it only takes like three seconds to say hey hope you're doing okay you know what i mean yeah we hope you guys are all doing okay and it's beautiful outside at least here in kansas it is so yeah we went outside and had drinks yesterday it was lovely it's all so nice at the sun i took three naps yesterday that's incredible and i've never i've never felt better in my life i mean i still feel like shit but it was like in that moment you were okay in that moment i knew she really be doing needing to sleep but Mm -hmm. that's all i got bud all right well be good be good wear a fucking mask and be safe